subject matter that we will speak to today is uh, making a verge, possibly more aptly uh, called an anchor, for the escapement of this little uh, clock movement. The uh, uh, verge, and we'll refer to it uh, by that uh, term in the discussion, the verge is uh, supported between these two pivot holes and uh, this is a recoil escapement. The dimension here is so four or five inches uh, 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 high. It's rather uh, narrow. This is uh, a movement from a miniature mission clock built by the Ingram Company in uh, uh, possibly in the late 1920s or early 1930s. I once heard a historian say that this uh, particular uh, model of clock was made by the train car lot for a newspaper in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, in the hard days of the Depression, if you paid uh, for your newspaper subscription a year in advance, you got uh, uh, one of these miniature mission clocks uh, uh, as a gift. I also heard the same historian say that the Ingram Company made these uh, by the uh, rail car lot uh, for a price of approximately 35 cents for the entire clock. So, so much for the history. This is a one-day movement. The mainspring mounts on the back right here. It's overhung on uh, this arbor. And uh, that spring wants to jump off uh, and come to pieces in your hand. and Simply mounting this to the back frame of the clock holds that um, uh, spring in place. It is about the simplest and most primitive movement that you could imagine. But uh, the reason that I chose this for this uh, uh, talk and this demonstration is the ease of seeing into the movement and that the recoil escapement is the classic American type recoil escapement uh, uh, using the verge of the uh, uh, steel strap uh, type. I will not uh, go into the pros and cons of the geometry and, and the adjustments and whatnot because the uh, demonstration is to show the techniques of the tools, the materials, and uh, how the escapement is uh, uh, constructed. It is uh, doing the work on it. There are many good uh, books that uh, treat the recoil escapement well from a scientific standpoint. And uh, during the earlier uh, portion of this year, the uh, official journal of the American Watchmakers Institute, that is uh, our logical times, has had some very, very good articles on the uh, recoil escape. <coughs> Let's uh, slip a plate's plate uh, from this uh, movement, look at the escape wheel, and uh, see what, uh, <coughs> what we have inside. This movement is in its entirety except uh, for one uh, wheel, the minute wheel, which uh, uh, should be on this post right here. We have it uh, over here at the side. But uh, this assembled, uh, disassembled, much as uh, uh, simple American uh, uh, made clock movements. <coughs> and we have here the escape wheel, lantern pinion. Uh, it's a recoil uh, uh, type escapement. It has uh, 42 uh, teeth. <coughs> The uh, uh, verge is uh, missing, and we want to go through the process of uh, making the verge and setting this into uh, uh, operation. The raw materials, <coughs> excuse me, the raw materials for making a uh, uh, verge are quite simple. The thing that we will use here is this piece of uh, uh, mild, steel, uh, mild steel rod, just one-eighth of an inch in diameter. And 
This is obtainable from uh, welding supply house. This is uh, really a steel welding rod, non steel welding rod. It has a slight copper flash on the uh, outside of the outside surface, and uh, we will remove that flash with a, a little piece of uh, 3M scouring pad. Uh, it looks somewhat like uh, a plastic version of steel wool, if you will that uh, is obtainable from the uh, grocery store. We wipe the copper flash off of this. It takes on a nice polish. Uh, the material is mild, mild steel. It has approximately the same hardness and approximately the same machinability as um, the uh, uh, arbors that's in the clock. And uh, that is uh, pretty typical for the American-made uh, uh, clocks of the general Era. So, being with these pivots, these arbors have been good for uh, some 50 plus years. Uh, I won't be ashamed of a, uh, using this that will uh, be good for a like period of time. The second thing is the material that we will make the, the uh, uh, verge pallet from. This little strip of material here, I had uh, uh, cut uh, many years ago. I had about uh, 100 or so of these uh, cut. They are five millimeters wide, about three and a half inches long, uh, a scant millimeter thick, about uh, 35 or 40 thousandths of an inch uh, uh, thick. And these were sheared for that, uh, uh, for the purpose of making uh, uh, scrap uh, birch pallets. The material is uh, high carbon steel and an annealed state. Now this is not something that you can readily obtain uh, from a material supply house or just uh, pick up in the hardware store. So that makes the, the raw material <coughs> for uh, this work a little difficult to obtain if we approach it from this standpoint. However, there is a piece of raw material that you have available in, in uh, your own shop that uh, uh, is very, very good. Uh, this is a piece of eight-day mainspring. This spring is about uh, oh, three quarters of an inch wide, 16, 17 thousandths of an inch uh, thick. <coughs> piece of a spring that was uh, broken or replaced for some uh, uh, reason. Now this spring is about, let's say, 16 thousandths of an inch thick. This material here is about um, uh, 35 or 38 thousandths of an inch thick. Some 40 years ago, a little more than 41 years ago, I suppose, in 1947, I made a verge pallet a piece of mainspring for a friend for a clock that had belonged to his forefathers. That clock, to my certain knowing, has been running 40 years since I made that um, uh, verge pallet. I cleaned and oiled the movement uh, about a year or so ago, and to my amazement, there was no discernible wear on that Palette. And I therefore concluded that you cannot have a better piece of material to make a strap pallet from than an old mainspring. So let's uh, speak to that. How do we use the mainspring? <coughs> let's see if we can get a magnifying glass in front of the camera and uh, look at this uh, piece of spring. Out here, the end, if you're my finger, you see this looks somewhat bright. As we come back, it looks blue, and then back in this region, it has a straw looking color. I turned the fire from a small propane torch uh, on this spring and heated it until it turned blue, and then on a, a little more, and it uh, became uh, quite soft. Now this can be touched with a file. You can file this very readily. And the grain, of course, is lengthwise in the strip of material. And um, I uh, use this 
and I make pallets from it by taking a lacquer pen, marking, uh, marking a stripe on this with a lacquer pen. I don't know if that will show up very well on the uh, uh, on the camera. Uh, using a caliper, and you can use a uh, divider for the same purpose, and stripe a mark down it like this. Then with a tenor shear, this can be uh, uh, cut to width. Uh, of course, it's annealed first, and that makes a strip that works very well. It can be formed uh, easily with a flyer. It can be set to shape, and when the job is finished, turn a little propane torch on the tip, bring it up to red, dip it in water, and leave it dead hard just right on the tip alone. Uh, on the, the tips. That gives you the ability to form it slightly in the background if you need uh, uh, further adjustment. <coughs> <coughs> we'll uh, uh, not use that in this particular uh, uh, case because I uh, already began to make the uh, verge from uh, this. Now let's see what this verge assembly must have. There must be an arbor. And the arbor, made from the uh, steel rod, and let's uh, see if we can pick up a description uh, from this piece that I've started making the arbor. This is about uh, scantily two inches long. And with a moderately coarse mill file, about an eight inch mill file, I filed away a slot right in here that removed half, one half of the diameter of the rod. <coughs> that is to make a pocket to nest the strap, to nest the pallet in. That is a, a pocket. Uh, file down to one half the rod diameter. The rod is 125 thousandths of an inch, so that says that uh, uh, the uh, distance that's removed is 62 or 63 thousandths of an inch. This material is 35 or 40 thousandths of an inch, so when we set, sit this in the pocket, we find that the rod overhangs the surface of the material by about 20 thousandths of an inch. The second thing that uh, we did here, away from this pocket, away from the pocket, about one millimeter away, that's about 40 thousandths of an inch if you're measuring in the English system, I, uh, with the jeweler saw, saw the slot as if you were going to saw this rod in, in half. And I sawed that slot to the same depth of this wider pocket slot here. And did the same thing on the other side. Let's see if we can see this with a magnifying glass. Let me see if I can get in focus here. The rod is uh, cut away, half the diameter is cut away, and the two slots are uh, cut one on either side of the large pocket. Now what we will ultimately do, <coughs> we will place this <coughs> strap in this central pocket, lay this harbor on the bench block, and with a small chisel, cold chisel, if you will, clockmaker size cold chisel. With a small chisel, we'll go into this slot, strike that with a hammer, and we will roll this material, we will roll that material over onto the strap. Now that permanently locks the strap in place. Many of your uh, American clock verges are made by this technique. Others have a hole drilled here and a rivet. <coughs> In fact,
fasten this as you may, but the thing I like to do is to snug this in place, check my adjustments and operation of the verge, and then lock it tightly. That gives me the ability to make some minor last minute uh, adjustments if need be. Now, the thing I will need to do is to carry this to the lathe now, uh, cut off the excess length, and form the pivots so that uh, we will uh, <coughs> uh, fit between the plates with the proper uh, end shape, side shape, etc. I don't uh, see any particular point in showing you a lathe operation that is this uh, uh, this simple. We uh, uh, can do this with uh, a tool held in a slide rest. You can probably do a job this simple faster and easier by using a handheld graver on the T-rest in the watchmaker's lathe. Uh, however that uh, you would like to do this uh, uh, in the, um, the lathe. A 1 8 inch rod can be held in a size 31 or 32 collet in the uh, watchmaker's lathe. The size 31 collet is about 4 ten thousandths of an inch tight. The si size 32 is just a little bit more than 4 ten thousandths of an inch loose. Once you have polished the surface of this, the diameter will reduce ever so slightly, and the 31 collet is uh, what I will probably be using. Now, when we cut the pivot, <coughs> We want to be sure the shoulders are square. We want to be sure that the body of the pivot is cylindrical. I want to put a, a tapered center about, oh, maybe a 60, 70 degree uh, center, bringing this to a point where it hangs just outside the plates because we will be setting this into a depthing tool for adjustment. If you don't use the depthing tool, if you adjust it within the uh, plates, the centers are still good because it uh, uh, gives us uh, an ease in uh, uh, assembly. So I'll do this, and I'll return with the um, uh, arbor in its uh, finished state in a few minutes. Returning, we have the, the arbor. Let's try getting this under the magnifying glass. We have the uh, arbor. We can see the uh, wide uh, space, the saddle, that the uh, uh, strap will mount in. We see the two saw slots that we're going to use to facilitate uh, uh, turning the uh, uh, edge of the material over to uh, lock the strap in place. We have the uh, pivots uh, on the ends and uh, uh, their uh, uh, centers. Possibly we can look at this uh, about uh, uh, here and uh, see what we have. You can see by the size of my hand about the magnification that we have on this. If we look at the length of the pivot, not the pivot of the arbor. The length of the arbor, uh, we have just a little in play if we drop this between the plates, taking a look right here. As a matter of fact, this, this movement uh, is not very rigid. The frame can flex on it when it's wound. So we gave this uh, rather liberal uh, in play, about uh, 10 or possibly 15 thousandths of an inch. The uh, pivot holes, uh, you can see how much I can carry this pivot round and round here. I can tip that pivot in that hole about uh, 
uh, possibly uh, five uh, degrees, called a five degree clearance, simply for the uh, sake of a term. And uh, that says that uh, we uh, will work in, within those holes, in this plate, uh, very, very uh, nicely. Now let's uh, look at, uh, at this. The scrap material will nest right in here. We'll use the chisel to close this over. We'll lock that scrap in place. Now the next thing that uh, we will do, we will take a plier and turn the end of this up and turn the other end up. We'll cut this off at some later time and we'll start forming the uh, uh, classic, start forming the uh, uh, classic shape of the uh, uh, birch palette itself. Let me pick up some tools and we'll look at uh, uh, this step a little further along the way. Not all workmen have a high dollar jetting tool as uh, this uh, is. I'll show you the use, some of the uses of this, and then I'll show you how to uh, accomplish the situation without the vector tool. The first thing, we want to pick up the centers. The centers, this uh, here, is the verge arbor pivot. This is the escape wheel arbor pivot holes. And we pick up that distance with the runners of the uh, depthing tool. That is adjusted by uh, this. Now one of the things we want to do <coughs> is to be sure <coughs> the uh, dimension we have is what we have. Uh, this has no verge bridge per se. These uh, little tangs uh, hang out here so that they could be formed up or down for a slight amount of adjustment. We start bending on these things on this old brass and they're subject to falling off, so we better lay off of uh, uh, the thought of, of uh, any significant adjustment in the bridge height. So we should make this verge in essence so that we can drop it in without any adjustment on the depth. <coughs> But in the event one of these has been adjusted in the past, let's see that the depth is equal on the two sides. And uh, in reality it, it is. It's ever so slightly different, but for all practical purposes uh, that is equal on the two sides. Now, that could have been located with uh, for instance, a uh, compass. That dimension could have been picked up with a compass. And let's make us a working tool to assess what we're, what's going to happen here. This is a little piece of uh, uh, card stock. Let's uh, call this our depth and tool now. I can hit that hole in the bench block and do this. I have that uh, uh, escape wheel lying flat on this piece of white stock so that we can see the teeth quite well. The tip of it's hanging through the, the bench block. If this were a compass rather than a depthing tool, we would do exactly the same thing. Uh, we come over and locate the verge pivot. All right, we've located our, uh, see if we can get this in the light, the verge pivot right there. 
I want to open that hole up. I want to open that hole up to take the arbor. Of the verge, this brought up here to about arbor size. All right, we've opened that to take up the the arbor, and we'll turn the face. We'll turn the face of the bottom of that slot directly toward the wheel. Now let's place the the wheel in place. Now we have a depthing tool that we can look into the escapement parts. We can look into these escapement parts and uh, uh, see what the shape of this pallet should be. Let me pick up another uh, piece of material here, and we'll be right back. Let's think about um, what the tips of the pallet looks like. Not a very round wheel here, but this is the entry pallet. This is the exit pallet. And our pivot point is going to be somewhere up in this uh, uh, region. If we make this distance, let's say this is the landing point when we enter to this pallet. If we make this distance right here about 75% of the tip to tip spacing between our teeth on the wheel, then this tip here should be just clearing inside of this tube. This should just pass in if this tips up. That's a judgment position that we have there. The second judgment position that we have, if we look at the distance from this tip to this pivot, Should approximately equal the distance from this pivot to the landing surface inside here. From the landing surface to the pivot should equal from pivot to tip. I'm sorry, the, the uh, yes, the, the, from pivot to tip equal the landing surface here. And the same condition on the other side. Now those are about the things that we want to look for in this. Second thing, if we look, if we imagine that this shape here strikes a continued line across the wheel, we will span some number of teeth here. Usually we span approximately one-fourth of the uh, total count of the wheel. Then this plane here projected should span the same number of teeth over here. Those are two judgment positions that uh, uh, we uh, uh, look on. This angle here will usually be somewhere around uh, 90 degrees or a little more, depending on the uh, teeth count around the wheel and what uh, uh, we span there. Not getting into the uh, uh, fine points of the escapement, we're uh, making the uh, verge to fit this particular uh, wheel. Now, while we were off the camera, I picked up a flyer and started forming uh, the piece that will become the, the verge pallet. You will notice here 
returned here, I used purely a judgment position, uh, judgment uh, of the shape because we don't have the, uh, the other palette in hand. Uh, the distance that this travels out here is somewhat immaterial if space is available inside the movement. This could turn rather shortly or it could extend on out here because we're only working on a small portion of uh, this with the wheel too. This distance here could be, this could be cut off at a variety of lengths, but that is influenced by the, the distance of the pivot of the uh, verge to the pivot of the escape wheel. All right, if we lay this on our imaginary, or, or lay this onto our paper depth and two, and rotate the wheel to the point that you're looking at the landing surface, looking at the landing surface on the entry pallet, and let's look for the place that we have to cut off, cut away here. Look at this. We'll make a judgment position on the uh, place of the pivot, and let's look for this end. Let's do this again. I would judge about here. Let's see if we can get the magnifying glass on this again. See the thing that we're using, how that we use the uh, 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 paper piece for our uh, uh, depthing tool and uh, where we go to work. I'm going to uh, cut the camera off. I'm going to saw this off right about here. Now remember, if we're making this from mainspring stock or the stock that I'm using here, this material is soft. It can be sawed, it can be filed, it can be uh, formed readily. It's not subject to breaking uh, unless we form the uh, uh, bends very short and unless we repeatedly uh, rework those bends. I'm going to saw this off and uh, we'll take a look at it. Another thing that I'm going to do while I'm uh, off the camera, I'm going to file this end, the angle, the angle of that tip is about like that now. I'm going to change that angle back like this to give it teeth clearance as um, uh, the wheel passes through. I'll cut this off. I'll give this an angle uh, back here because the exit tooth lands on the inside. We'll be back in a uh, few moments and uh, see what uh, we're doing. Well, a few moments got to being uh, uh, several minutes uh, there. I found that I had painted myself into a corner. The uh, vise that I hold uh, this type of thing in fastens on the bench right where I'm uh, uh, working and uh, I didn't have anything to hold the piece to uh, saw it. The thing I'm doing here right at the moment, I have a little three-cornered uh, scraper. Uh, this is a deburring tool, and I'm uh, scraping the edges of uh, uh, this to get all the uh, furs off. Now let's uh, let's slip this onto this arbor, and what looks like. about the right position. I don't have quite enough friction to keep that from from falling out. Uh, when I deburred it there, I opened that up a little. Let's uh, lay it in and, and see what we can do. 
and uh, I think I think that we are pretty much I think that we're pretty much right there. It slipped out of the arbor then. So what we'll do, we'll lock this thing in place. Now when I say lock it in place, I'm talking about um, uh, lock it in place uh, temporarily. <coughs> temporarily meaning uh, with a little bit of uh, forgiveness so that we can slide it like this when we go to make our adjustment. So uh, let's, uh, let's lock that in place. I'll pick up a pipe and be right back. The punch is not uh, literally a punch, it's a little chisel. It's uh, in my punch set. This uh, angle on the tippy end of this tippy end is about oh, 45 degrees approximately. <coughs> and uh, we'll lay this on the bench block. I think I'll use a block that doesn't have so many holes in it. Uh, sit this in uh, approximate uh, uh, position. May be able to do better here after all. No, I can't. I was going to use that uh, slot to nest the uh, piece in. You may notice I've swapped the ends with, with this two or three times. That is not of consequence at this point because the center, the escape wheel in this movement is exactly centered between the plates. So when I go in like this, I can go in either way on this arbor because we haven't drilled the uh, hole for the crutch wire yet. So we'll just uh, uh, drop in here, set on uh, the chisel. hands here. When I de bird I got that uh, uh, so that I can't just press it in and it remain there. Now we've got just enough friction to hold that in place. Just enough to, to hold it in place. I'm afraid it'll drop out if um, I don't handle it carefully. I want to close the other side slightly now. All right. I think that's snug enough that it's uh, that it's in place. Now let's uh, let's make a a measurement here. This can be measured. This is not an absolute measurement, but it can be measured uh, with uh, uh, a caliper or a divider. I'm going to hook on to the side of this arbor and measure the landing position about here and then I'm going to compare to the other side and uh, we'll adjust for about a landing position go to the other side and see if that approximately reaches the tip and it does not that means I need to move the pallet in that direction I move that slightly Measure this again, and uh, again, I need to move it a little more. So 
just a little bit more. Here. I believe I'm going to snug that just ever so slightly tighter there, and we'll take a look and see what what we have. All right. I'm staking this against the back side there. The arbor will remain straight. This uh, begins to uh, lock in. Now, I should drop that in my homespun. Uh, uh, depthing tool here and take a look. I want to use an eye loop to look into this. I may have to get out of the camera to see this. And I don't think I'm too far from being uh, uh, correct there. Let's try the two pieces in our depthing tool and uh, see what we have. Now, if you do not have the depthing tool, I would suggest you look at it a little more careful in the paper model, and uh, then uh, use the uh, movement itself. here and take a look at the eye loop. And uh, we're incorrect. We're incorrect. <coughs> Let's verify the uh, this again. We're okay. So our verge is, is uh, incorrect at uh, this point. What is the incorrectness on it? What is the obvious uh, uh, incorrectness that we have? Notice that I can rotate the wheel. If I tip this ever so uh, uh, slightly here and land on the exit pallet, when it's released, the entrance pallet does not engage the wheel. Now that tells me that uh, I've got the verge too shallow. That is, the distance, the distance from the axis of the shaft downward, the distance from the axis of the shaft downward is too small. It says that I cut this too short, formed this in too far, uh, come too straight out in the backbone here or any of those uh, uh, possible conditions. Now, where do we go from there? Now here's the beauty of having the uh, uh, soft backbone. I'll take a ply, I will form this downward, I will form this downward, right here, ever so slightly, I will form this downward, right here, ever so slightly, retouch the position with the tips, and that will uh, engage it deeper. I believe that I'm close enough, and if this was an adjustable verge bridge, that uh, it would be as simple as lowering that uh, bridge ever so slightly, and uh, I would be okay. But let's uh, set this thing up so that we can put it into the movement without touching the height of the bridge. Be back in a moment. With uh, a smooth jaw plier, you'll just form this down slightly there, and We'll pull this up a little there, and we'll 
be approximately the same on the other side. All right? Let's see how we're doing there. Get enough. Not enough. Very good. Mighty close, but yet not enough. Wrong wheel. Got to have a little more. Guess what? Too deep. Too deep, and the tips are too close. Let's uh, speak to the spacing of the tips first. And. Uh, I think we're pretty close. I think we're pretty close there. You can see the action of the uh, birch pallet. I'll get in a little closer with my eye loop and and uh, take a look. I believe I'm there. I believe I am there at that uh, that point. All right. <clears throat> In that case, I want to uh, stake this in permanently now. Just can't get this where you can see it in the there and there. And let's look again. I think that is uh, just fine. Now, for the proof of the pudding, the real McCoy, I'm going to try it in the plates. See? 
wheel turns clockwise in this. It says that our entry pallet will have to be to the left. And uh, we will set these in place. Not easy to uh, do this kind of thing. My eyes are 68 years old, and uh, it's just not convenient to get an eye loop under this uh, camera. And uh, a lot of this has to be done by by touch. It appears that I am ever, ever so slightly too deep. Ever so slightly too deep. All right? That's just exactly where I would like for this to be at this point. Ever so slightly too deep. I will take a buff stick and I'll polish the active surfaces on this, the inside of the exit pallet, the outside of the uh, uh, entrance pallet. I will polish those two, um, <coughs> two surfaces and uh, uh, then we will make the uh, uh, adjustment to the point where that, uh, we could uh, uh, test run the movement. Uh, I can feel some blurs on there. I can feel them when I was uh, testing uh, this. But uh, at this point, let's see if we can locate where our crutch wire needs to be. We look at this. The uh, suspension spring goes in this slot and uh, it says we need the crutch wire on the near end to me. We need the crutch wire on the near end to me. And we need that uh, wire to possibly go about straight up. We need that we need that wire to head straight up right about here. Not too different, not too different from the uh, uh, plane of uh, uh, this. I will uh, drill this and then we will go through the uh, process of uh, uh, fitting the uh, uh, wire to it. I don't see much point in simply showing you how to drill a hole. I will tell you this, that uh, I'll set this in the uh, bench block, take a small quick punch, and quick the starting hole. Set this in the bench block, we'll quick the uh, uh, starting hole, we'll drill that uh, 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 hole, then rivet in the wire. What do we make the wire out of? There's a roll of uh, brass wire, very, very soft. This is about uh, approximately a millimeter in diameter. Well, it's a little more than a millimeter. It's about 46 thousandths of an inch in diameter. And uh, that wire is really, I found this, come from a hardware store, is uh, pretty soft to hold an adjustment of a crutch wire unless the wire is short. In this case, the wire probably needs to be about this long, some four or five inches long. Uh, when we want to harden this a piece of this wire, 
The way to do that is screw that up in a vise, tip of it in a vise, get back here and take a, a heavy ply. I use them um, about a uh, nine inch electrician's lineman's uh, ply. And I catch that and pull it. And I pull this until I stretch it about 10% in length. That work hardens the uh, material and work hardening it stiffens it. Uh, being that this wire is going to be short, I think I will not uh, go through the process of work hardening it. And being it's about 40 uh, six thousandths of an inch in diameter, I'll use a, a drill a bit to drill that hole that's down around 40 thousandths of an inch in diameter. I want the hole to be smaller, uh, slightly smaller than the wire. So I'll go off the camera and, and uh, drill this hole and we'll be back and, and set the clutch wire in place. While uh, we were off the camera, I drilled the, uh, the hole in the uh, arbor shaft, arbor, uh, verge arbor, and uh, we measured the uh, diameter on it. You measure the diameter by slipping a, a round brooch in the hole and then uh, measuring against the brooch. And that is about uh, 41 thousandths of an inch. I uh, passed a tapered brooch through the hole to uh, uh, clean it out, to deburr it. I used the wire, which is about 45 thousandths of an inch, uh, uh, something in that uh, order, looks like it's about 46 or 7. I filed a taper on the wire here so that I can start that into the hole. And uh, the uh, taper is such that I can just begin to pass through the hole on this side. I relocated the hole from the position that we uh, discussed a little earlier. And the reason for that, I decided that that uh, crutch wire passed out through this opening here rather than out over the top. So that caused me to relocate the hole uh, ever so slightly. Now, let's see how we fasten this, this wire onto the arbor. This is one of the great mysteries in uh, clock making as to how that you can fasten a wire on so that it is on very, very tight and uh, never comes loose. The way you do that, as a repairman, I'm not sure how they do that in, in uh, manufacturing. I just turn the end of that up like this and uh, catch this thing in a, in a vise, hold it very tightly. Remember now that uh, this um, uh, is tapered and we clean the hole with a uh, brooch is also tapered. I want to hold just as much of this in the glass jaw as I can. This is a smooth jaw vise here. And uh, we want this to come out at the uh, uh, bottom. We're exiting the bottom. Get a little closer to the edge here. Up there. We ring that in place best we can. Take a small overshot punch. Go over the top of this. And drive this down just as much as we can, consistent with the strength of the wire below. Now we lift this down to where we almost almost touch down to the vice jaws and we clip the top here. This 
isn't the appropriate ply, lineman's ply. It's the one I have on the bench at the moment. We clip that. Now we rivet this down. Doing two things. We're upsetting the uh, uh, surface of it there, and we're also upsetting the surface underneath here. We're upsetting the surface at, at the top and underneath uh, here. And that makes that wire in there very, very uh, rigid. We straighten up, we uh, iron the wrinkles out of the, uh, uh, the wire this way and we take the little 3M scouring pad and we do burn the wire. There we have it. Now let's drop the escape wheel out of the uh, uh, movement and see about what the form of this must look like. It looks like that the form must turn like that and come straight out like this. Let's see how that's going to look. like that. And uh, for the time being, we will not form the uh, tip uh, over. Let me get the suspension rod from this and see if we can discern about what the shape should be down that way. Returning to the camera, I have uh, on the uh, crutch, what appears to be about uh, uh, the right shape. I place this on a little wire scratch wheel and bust off all of the uh, burrs that was around the edge, polish the surface here and inside. Now, the question is that we have um, a functioning burge and if we do, then uh, it will be necessary to heat treat uh, the functional tips. But at this point, we have left these uh, soft uh, in the event that there may be some additional adjustment required. Let's drop this in the, in the movement and uh, see what, uh, what we have here. I believe I'll do a little better if I assemble the frame here uh, first. Let's get the uh, nut started on, on this. And progress up the uh, crane. There we are. Now we will drop the uh, uh, verge in place and see if we're just about right. Hopefully we should be uh, Functional here. Lost a pivot off the escape wheel there. Now I'll drop the 
이렇게 돼요. 
I wire brushed uh, uh, all of this, which gave it a satin uh, finish that uh, obscures the uh, scratch marks and, and uh, layout marks and whatnot from uh, making the piece, so that it uh, uh, the appearance is uh, very, very nice. <coughs> I don't think that I can very well show on the film the heat treating of the uh, uh, palette. So let me describe what I'll do there. The reason being, I don't think that I can handle the flame uh, of that uh, torch right in the close-up, immediate close-up proximity of this camera is the thing I'm concerned about. Uh, the thing I'll do with, is to remove this and uh, uh, hold the palette somewhere in the back frame area here and uh, heat one of the tips until it is uh, quite a bright red and we'll douse that in uh, cold water. Now I'll hold that with a plier back here in the back frame to serve as a heat sink. Then uh, I will take it out of the water, dry it off, hold the back frame, and heat the other uh, palette and uh, quench it in water. Now the purpose of holding this uh, back frame and the plier is to serve as a heat sink to prevent the uh, heat from traveling from one palette to the other and possibly annealing the uh, uh, first one. There may be a little fire scale uh, on this as a result of that heat treating operation and uh, I will uh, wire brush that again and then possibly touch down with a uh, buff stick on it. One of the things that I frequently do is uh, uh, coat the area that's to be heat treated with um, uh, silver soldering flux. I use uh, a flux, a white cream-like uh, flux, which is really uh, uh, powdered borax and water, and uh, you, you place the flux on the steel and bring the heat up quite slowly so that the uh, uh, moisture that's in it evaporates and uh, uh, does not uh, uh, blow the flux off of the surface. If you heat it too rapidly, the water boils and uh, then that blows off, uh, blows the flux from the surface and it'll leave uh, some spots of fire scale. However, <clears throat> if you bring the temperature up uh, quickly and uh, if you use a flame that uh, is a, uh, what uh, commonly called a soft flame, then uh, you can avoid the fire scale. There will be uh, practically none uh, on the uh, surface. So that's what uh, what I'll do. I believe I will not show that on the on the camera for the reasons that I just mentioned. And when I get this, we'll take a look at it as it come out of the fire and uh, uh, see what the fire scale looks like. Then uh, I will uh, uh, polish that and place it uh, back in the movement. It's entirely possible that it may require a small adjustment after heating and quenching in uh, uh, the water. I usually uh, send this uh, uh, into the um, uh, water arbor end first so that both ends uh, go into the water about the uh, same time. If you go in flat side first, one of these uh, flat surfaces first, then there's a possibility that uh, you uh, distort the shape of it. So I will give this the heat treatment, then we'll look at it, then I'll polish it again, we'll place it in the uh, movement, and take a look again. Be with you in a few minutes. Just over four minutes has left since uh, uh, we went off camera to uh, heat treat this uh, uh, unit. Let's uh, look and see what, uh, what we can see here. This was heated with a torch. This is a propane, uh, little propane uh, 
uh, torch with a gas cylinder, and it was heated holding the torch something like this, not quite this close to get into the uh, cone of the flame. This was heated until it was glowing uh, uh, quite bright red, right in this area, and then inserted in a, a drinking cup of water, insert, inserted in like this. And then the same thing was done on the uh, other side, holding the flame so that it would uh, touch just the tips. Now, if we take a look, this is blue right in this uh, region. And uh, get back into the to the camera here. This is blue right in. Uh, uh, this region, and uh, around here it was hotter, it is not uh, uh, not blue there, and then there is no discoloration right in the, the backbone area here. Uh, let's see if we can get a, a look at that blue right here in the area. Now if we pick up, the blue begins again right about here, and uh, on around uh, here. There is practically no um, uh, fire scale uh, on this. Discoloration, yes, but uh, uh, practically no uh, uh, fire scale to uh, uh, be seen on this. Now, <clears throat> let's see if we got any result. We take this little fine cut file here, and that file just skids over there like a piece of glass. We try it over here on this side, and same situation there. Uh, I can just touch it with a file back here in the back, in, in that uh, uh, blue region, and it can be filed fairly easily uh, back in the uh, backbone section. Now, what this does is gives us the ability to make some minor adjustments on the, the formation uh, in this backbone area. Most clockmakers have been around for quite a number of years has attempted to open or close one of these from a, an old American clock and had it to go plink. And uh, that's the reason that uh, I uh, uh, just treat these right out on the tip. All right, I'm going off the camera again and uh, I'm going to wire brush this, a little rotary wire brush. I'll spend about Oh, maybe about 60 seconds. I've got a little wheel about uh, two and a half inches in diameter with uh, soft steel wire uh, bristles, and uh, it's in a lathe over here to my left. I'll wire brush this a little, and then we'll take a look and see what that does for it. Let's see what um, what we look like after uh, that uh, brushing operation. I uh, will need to look at this with the, uh, with the eye loop to get a better appraisal of what's happened. The polish remains very, very good on the uh, uh, on the functional surfaces of the paddles. The discoloration from the heat treatment is essentially gone. You can see some evidence of it, and even with the material uh, uh, brightened, there is a slight difference in the heat-treated area from the uh, uh, non-treated area. Got some black. The, the uh, wire brush was uh, slightly oily from something that uh, we've been using uh, previously. Now, uh, having that done, we will uh, call this. Uh, Verge uh, finished. We're yet to place it back into the uh, movement, and uh, uh, presumably it will not require any additional adjustment. But uh, that's the whole package. I'll bring the movement together, get it into the uh, uh, case, and we'll look at it uh, running before I close the case up. Let me look at the clock and see what. Uh, how much time I've spent on this. It's um, 
10 minutes uh, past 1 o'clock here. I started on this about uh, 7.30 this morning, and I've had several very substantial uh, uh, interruptions. Uh, the most uh, significant one, uh, we have an uh, acquaintance in the hospital uh, over in uh, Brown Rock, uh, Texas, some 12 or 15 miles away. And sometime up in the morning, I uh, went over there and spent about, uh, about two and a half hours over at the uh, hospital, plus a little travel time. We have uh, eaten lunch already and uh, had some other minor interruptions along the way. I suppose I, suppose I have spent uh, about two full working hours in uh, bringing this together and uh, showing it on the tape. We'll ask the question, is it, uh, uh, is it possible to do that? The answer is probably no, probably no. Uh, these can be purchased uh, from uh, supply houses, and if you would like to know how to purchase one of those, the simplest thing to do, and I'm speaking of primarily of the uh, uh, information that I find in the uh, tool and clock parts catalog that's uh, put out by the S. La Rose Company. Uh, they have a table that shows the diameter of the escape wheel and the tooth count. The diameter of the wheel and the tooth count in that wheel. And then uh, when you have those two factors, when you have those two factors, then they point you to a, uh, a suitable uh, uh, verge. Now, the problem is that you may have a problem in getting the shaft length uh, correct on these because the verges that they supply that uh, are for mounting between the plates are really uh, pretty limited in number. However, the ones that uh, have a saddle, a saddle on them and function on a pin, take for instance, uh, let's look at this uh, uh, right here. This is a verge in making. This is the saddle and uh, the holes in it, and this is the hole for the uh, 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 crutch wire to go in, and this is yet to be formed. I have, uh, several such as, as this uh, uh, here in the shop. Here's another one that is uh, most nearly uh, finished. They have quite a good selection on those. I make these up from time to time. Uh, and this is the way that uh, the verge of the saddle type begins. This is what you find in the classic uh, kitchen clock. Uh, at another time, we'll uh, show how to uh, produce one of these. This really can be made a little easier than this. However, that saddle, that saddle, if you do not know how to make that saddle, that is a stumbling block extraordinaire. And the real situation is how do you raise up the dimples and get the uh, uh, pivot hole centered in them so I place this into the into the movement, the movement in the case, and uh, we'll look at the finished job running. Now again, is it profitable to make it? No, but it is profitable to your skills to make a few of these so that you can, and uh, it improves your dexterity uh, greatly. The object here was not to uh, teach uh, uh, escapement technology to show that how uh, parts can be made and brought together and function and uh, be a very good uh, uh, representation of what the original part looked like. Thank you. I'm J.M. Huckabee. I'm a certified master clockmaker, certified by the American Watchmakers Institute, and uh, reside on the J.B. Ranch on the near outskirts of north, of, uh, north side of Austin, Texas. Thank you for being with me today.